health emergency on his hands than a national emergency. The borders at Coote, Surrey, Windsor and Emerson have all been cleared. There are no more blockades at any borders. Trucks are still here downtown in Ottawa and they need to move. But in light of the rapidly changing landscape, can the Prime Minister tell us where is the serious threat of violence to Canadians for ideological purposes, which is the threshold that needs to be met for the Emergencies Act? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the invocation of the Emergencies Act is not something to be done lightly. It is not something to be done as a first resort or even a second resort. But it was necessary to be done to give local law enforcement across the country the tools to handle these illegal blockades, uh, to be able to ensure uh, restoration of order, and to make sure that Canadians, uh, whether they're losing shifts or, or seeing supplies delayed on the way through the borders, uh, be able to get back uh, to their daily lives. This is a decision we took, and of course, uh, Parliament is going to have an opportunity to debate it. The Leader of the Opposition. To Canadians' fundamental freedoms must be justified and must meet a legal criteria. Experts across the country have said these requirements have not been met. The Prime Minister hasn't given Canadians a clear reason why he's invoking the Emergencies Act. In fact, things are de escalating as we speak. So, why is the Prime Minister using this hammer on Canadians? Isn't it true he's doing it just to save his own political skin? The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker. Over the past few weeks, Canadians have been suffering, whether it's uh, because of border crossings, uh, whether it's because of illegal blockades in their neighbourhoods. Uh, this is something uh, that required extra tools that we have put in law enforcement's hands. Now, of course, law enforcement, the local law enforcement jurisdiction, can use these tools or not as they are available. But the threshold was met for the Emergencies Act, and now across the country, Police of jurisdiction have the tools necessary to keep people safe. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. The Prime Minister calls people he disagrees with racist, misogynist. He spent the last month wedging, dividing, stigmatizing and traumatizing Canadians. I understand the Prime Minister admires basic dictatorships, but let's remind the Prime Minister this is Canada, this is not a dictatorship. The Prime Minister is actually pouring gasoline on embers. Isn't it true the Prime Minister is doing this for one reason and one reason alone? It's to save his own political career. simply can't have it both ways. They spent weeks complaining that we weren't doing enough uh, to restore order in this country, and now when we move forward to give people the tools they need. I'm going to have to interrupt the honourable prime, the right honourable prime minister. Uh, you know, I've been getting emails from people who are watching us at home, and they're pretty ashamed of their parliament because of the shouting that goes on. One person brought something up. They said, well, all the shouting happens at the beginning. Why not start with the end questions? If this continues at the beginning, I'm going to the last question, turn my list upside down, and we'll start at the end. The Honourable Prime Minister, please continue. Mr. Speaker, Conservatives can't have it both ways. They spent the first few weeks of this uh, challenge and illegal blockades saying that the government needed to act and take responsibility. Uh, and then when we finally moved forward in a responsible way, when the time was right to bring in the Emergencies Act, they are now complaining uh, that we've done too much. At the same time and throughout, Mr. Speaker, they continue to stand with and support and cheer on these illegal blockades. Mr. Speaker, they're the ones playing politics. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. The man who wore blackface more times than he can remember took a terrorist with him to a trip for, on India, gave Omar Qadar $10 million. We're not going to stop talking to our constituents just because the Prime Minister disagrees with them. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister says he's following science when it comes to mandates, but that's 
that's not what Canada's top doctors are saying. It's time to end the mandates and the restrictions. The Prime Minister is ignoring the science. There is a mental health crisis in this country, and continued lockdowns and mandates keeping Canadians separated are making it worse. So will the Prime Minister commit to Canadians he'll follow the science? Well, Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the invocation of the Emergencies Act is something that is extremely serious and that we have taken extremely seriously. Uh, it followed specific steps that were taken that will continue in this House. It followed consultation with the Premiers, uh, and it uh, gives the tools in a proportionate and responsible way uh, to the officers of jurisdiction to be able to end these illegal blockades. Uh, this will be a moment that will be studied in the history books, and what the people will see was the Conservatives never stop playing personal partisan politics. Let's try the Honourable Member for Kitchener Centre. I believe he has a question today. Mr. Speaker, there is no doubt the pandemic has had a devastating impact on our mental health, putting further strain on a system that already had long-standing gaps. In Waterloo, Wellington, 15 children and youth were waiting to be seen by child psychiatrists at CMHA before the pandemic. Now they have 190 on the waiting list. The fact is, mental health is health. As called for by the Canadian Alliance on Mental Health and Mental Illness and others, will the Prime Minister prioritize funding and legislation to ensure every Canadian has timely access to inclusive and accessible mental health? Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I can't agree enough with the member for Kitchener Centre. Mental health is health. We must ensure it is a full and equal part of our universal health care system. It's why we're committing to establishing the Canada Mental Health Transfer to expand the delivery of high-quality, free mental health services. We want to encourage all Canadians who need support to check out wellnesstogether.ca for resources and download the PocketWell app, available 24-7, where you can access a range of resources, including free and confidential virtual sessions with social workers, psychologists and other professionals. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. The numbers speak for themselves. Alcohol and substance abuse, suicide, domestic violence and child abuse have all increased over the last two years. These are not just statistics. These are real Canadians who are dealing with real heartache. And unnecessary mandates and restrictions are hurting us all. Science has saved lives, and the science is clear. We can start to open up, Mr. Speaker. Will the Prime Minister trust the numbers, trust the experts, and tell us when he'll end the mandates and the restrictions? Yeah. Honourable Prime Minister. You know how difficult these past two years have been for Canadians uh, with this pandemic, but we also have demonstrated that throughout it, Canadians have each other's backs, just like this government has had Canadians' backs with vaccines, with rapid tests, uh, with supports for small businesses, workers and families. And we will continue to have people's backs and follow the science. That's why we were pleased uh, to announce loosening of the restrictions on, border, on borders as travel is more available to Canadians. And we will continue continue to follow the, uh, the science every step of the way to keep Canadians safe. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Avec le recul et à la lecture des documents relatifs à l'application ou à l'évocation de la loi sur les mesures d'urgence, on a de plus en plus l'impression qu'il s'agit d'abord d'une opération de camouflage de l'échec du gouvernement du Premier ministre. J'ai bien hâte que la Chambre et l'ensemble des élus soient appelés à en débattre parce que l'Assemblée nationale, unanimement, est contre. Le gouvernement du Québec against, est contre. Le Bloc québécois est contre. Les députés conservateurs du Québec sont contre. Against, Pourquoi est-ce que le Premier ministre n'exclut-il pas Act? simplement Why les provinces qui le souhaitent de l'application des décrets? Le Premier ministre, pendant autour de deux semaines, le chef du Bloc québécois implorait, exigeait que le gouvernement agisse de façon ferme pour contrer ces barricades. Illégal. Or, on a pris la mesure 
lors de la loi sur les urgences de façon proportionnée, responsable, qui respecte tout à fait euh, la, la Charte des droits et libertés et euh, qui euh, va permettre aux ju juridictions qui n'en ont pas besoin de ne pas l'utiliser. Et, et maintenant, il trouve une autre chose pour, pour critiquer. C'est sa job comme chef de l'opposition. Moi, ma job, c'est de protéger les Canadiens. Monsieur le Président, lui, sa job, c'est de servir les Canadiens. Et il n'est pas censé de desservir les Québécois pour servir les Canadiens. Entre tous, le premier ministre actuel du Canada devrait être conscient qu'il y a au Québec une sensibilité particulière à référer à ce rejeton maquillé de la loi sur les mesures de guerre. Monsieur le Président, le gouvernement du Canada a toujours été présent pour les Canadiens dans le besoin, incluant les Québécois. Quand il y a eu des défis au niveau des CHSLD, le gouvernement du Canada a envoyé de l'aide par les forces armées canadiennes. Nous avons maintenant donné de l'aide aux forces policières à travers le pays qui vont pouvoir utiliser ou non les outils qui sont nécessaires dans cette dans ce moment difficile, nous respectons entièrement les, les Québécois et tous les Canadiens, mais nous allons donner les outils nécessaires pour garder l'ordre, la sécurité et la liberté de tous les Canadiens. Monsieur le Président, nous sommes dans une crise nationale parce que tous les niveaux de gouvernement ont failé à reconnaître la sérieuse de cette crise. En plus de ça, we see a glaring difference in the treatment of indigenous and racialized protesters as opposed to the way, as opposed to the way the convoy is being treated. Canadians are deeply concerned about that. So what is the Prime Minister going to do to address the serious concerns that people have that there is a disproportionate treatment of racialized people and indigenous people as compared to the convoy, and what will he do to fix that? The right honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as a government for a number of years now, we've recognized systemic racism and pledged and worked uh, towards reducing it. Uh, the reality that racialized Canadians, Indigenous Canadians face uh, worse outcomes and treatments uh, from uh, the, the, our justice system, from uh, police systems, is one of those things uh, that we have uh, pledged to counter. We work closely with Black and Indigenous communities to make sure that we are reducing the barriers and ensuring equitable treatment, particularly in moments of crisis like this one. Number four, Burnaby South. On est dans une crise nationale national et on doit crisis, le régler. Mais c'est aussi important de s'assurer qu'on n'applique pas sure les lois sur l'urgence dans les régions où on n'a pas besoin. Le Premier ministre s'engagera-t-il à ne pas appliquer les lois sur l'urgence où ils ne sont pas nécessaires? Mm -hmm. Le très honorable la loi sur les mesures d'urgence a été invoquée de façon raisonnable, de façon proportionnée et de façon à pouvoir être ciblée là où c'est seul où ils en ont besoin. Ça donne aux polices de juridiction locales plus d'outils s'ils en ont besoin. S'ils n'en ont pas besoin, ils n'auront pas à les utiliser, M. le Président. C'est comme ça que cette proposition raisonnable, cette application raisonnable de la loi sur les mesures de la, de la, de la, de la loi sur les mesures d'urgence fonctionne. L'honorable député de Bellechasse, les échemins Lévis. Monsieur le Président, vendredi dernier, le 11 février, le Premier ministre a dit que la police d'Ottawa avait toutes les ressources pour mettre fin à l'impasse. Le 14 février, il invoque soudainement les mesures d'urgence. Que s'est-il passé entre le 11 et le 14 février pour justifier cette décision. Et sur quel principe juridique s'est-il basé? Est-ce pour détourner l'attention de son manque flagrant de leadership? Monsieur le Président, la loi sur les mesures d'urgence n'est pas un outil à prendre en première instance ou même en deuxième instance. C'est une question de regarder et de s'assurer que les ressources nécessaires sont disponibles pour les forces de l'ordre pour pouvoir faire leur job. Or, on a été là depuis les débuts pour donner plus de ressources à la police d'Ottawa, aux, aux services policiers à travers le pays. Et lundi, on a choisi d'être 
d'invoquer la loi sur les mesures d'urgence pour leur donner encore plus d'outils. Pour le député de Bellechasse, les échelons Merci, M. le Président. Le Premier ministre Legault a la situation sous contrôle au Québec et d'autres provinces ne souhaitent pas avoir les mesures d'urgence appliquées chez eux non plus. Tout ce que ce Premier ministre fait, c'est d'ajouter de l'huile sur le feu et jouer à des jeux partisans. Est-ce que le Premier ministre peut nous expliquer pourquoi tout le pays devrait subir les conséquences liées à une situation circonscrite à Ottawa? Le Premier ministre. Monsieur le Président, c'est des barricades illégaux ont des conséquences à travers le pays. On a vu des interdictions aux frontières d'un bout à l'autre de ce pays et c'est une urgence qui exige la loi sur les mesures d'urgence. Et donc, on a donné des outils que les polices de juridiction locale peuvent utiliser, mais n'ont pas besoin d'utiliser s'ils n'en ont pas besoin. C'est comme ça que cette loi sur les mesures d'urgence fonctionne et d'ailleurs va toujours respecter la Charte des droits et libertés partout où elle sera en application. Norfolk. The Emergency Measures Act is a declaration of a state of national urgency. It is a blunt force tool that should only be used under the most serious circumstances when legal powers have been exhausted. The Canadians do not believe that this Prime Minister has exhausted all efforts. Yeah. The Emergency Measures Act gives extraordinary powers to the government. The Prime Minister would have received judicial advice from judicial officers. When will this Prime Minister make that advice available to the public? The right Honourable Prime Minister. And the protest, uh, sorry, once again, the Conservative Party is trying to have it both ways. Uh, they spent the first few weeks both uh, complaining that the federal government wasn't acting while encouraging the illegal barricades, uh, and now that the federal government has put in the hands of local police officers uh, justified, proportional, measured tools that will absolutely conform with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, uh, they are now complaining that we have acted. We we will continue to do what is necessary to keep Canadians and their communities and our economy safe. Well, member for Haldeman Norfolk. Canadians are tired of talking points. They want real answers. The Prime Minister's own words created fear. What are we going to do with these people? These people are taking up space, he said. These are the words of a failed leader who robbed Canadians of hope and of unity, and that is why they took to the streets. When will this Prime Minister? to stop doubling down on his failed leadership and admit that it is it is his divisive words and mandates that led to so much turmoil in this country. What the member opposite believes, the vaccine mandates we came forward with in this country saved lives. The vaccine mandates uh, for travelers, uh, for federal public servants, contributed to one of the highest vaccination rates in the world uh, by Canadians. That has kept people safer. It has allowed our economy to come roaring back and has allowed us to get through this uh, challenging pandemic better than most. Unfortunately, Conservatives are now supporting illegal blockades that are harming our economy. That's not what... Member for Calgary knows Hill. Earlier in question period, the Prime Minister said that the Emergencies Act should not be the, quote, first or second thing that should be used to resolve a crisis situation. What were the first and second things that the Prime Minister did? And how does the failure of those actions provide legal justification for the invocation of the Emergencies Act? The right honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, when we began to see illegal blockades in place, we made sure that the RCMP uh, was there to offer resources to local police of jurisdiction, to work with the OPP uh, to ensure that the support and planning is was there for the police of local jurisdiction uh, to take action. As time went on and uh, these uh, illegal blockades became more and more dug in, we saw that there was a need for more and more tools until it got to the point where Canadians' livelihoods, uh, Canadians' well-being, the residents of Ottawa uh, being severely impacted, threats of violence at border crossings across the country. The Honourable Member for Calgary knows Hill. The problem with that argument is that the illegal blockades at the Ambassador Bridge and the Coots crossings occurred prior to the Emergencies Act being involved, without federal help. 
and the Emergency Act was not needed to settle the rail blockades of 2020, the Oka crisis, the crisis at Caledonia, September 11th, the COVID-19 pandemic, or any other dispute in Canadian history. The Prime Minister has not provided any legal justification for the use of the Emergencies Act, a historic unfettered power grab. He needs to calmly tell Canadians why he has failed and what is different today. The Honourable Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the invocation of the Emergencies Act is not something to be done lightly. On that, we absolutely agree. That is why not only uh, did we lay out the rationale uh, and uh, explain to Canadians why we're doing it and how we're doing it, not only why we made sure that the uh, new powers are circumspect, are proportional, are to be used only where they are needed, uh, but we also are about to have uh, days of debate in the House on exactly these questions questions so that parliamentarians and indeed all Canadians are able uh, to see that this was necessary. Le député de Dans un premier temps, Monsieur le Président, j'invite le Premier Speaker, ministre à lire son propre décret avant de lire ses réponses à des questions en Chambre. Ça ne dit pas que les provinces choisissent ou pas. Ça dit que le gouvernement fédéral choisit où il agit ou pas. Deuxième chose, j'invite les gens du NPD à réfléchir sérieusement, compte tenu de l'histoire de leur parti qui courageusement s'est opposé à la loi sur les mesures de guerre en 70. Troisième chose, c'est une honte, une honte de comparer l'usage humanitaire de l'armée canadienne au Québec avec la loi sur les mesures d'urgence. Est-ce qu'il réalise qu'on se détourne de l'intérêt de l'armée canadienne Premier ministre. Monsieur le Président, cette pandémie a été difficile pour tout le monde dans ce pays. On a perdu trop d'êtres chers. On a vu les choses qu'on prenait pour acquis limitées. On a dû faire face à des défis au niveau de la santé mentale, au niveau de nos communautés. Mais à chaque étape, on a vu les Canadiens être là les uns pour les autres. Que ce soit les travailleurs de première ligne au Québec, que ce soit des services d'urgence en Colombie-Britannique, que ce soit des gens qui sont là pour leurs voisins. On a vu ce qu'il y a de meilleur dans les Canadiens. Et maintenant, avec ces barricades illégales un peu partout qui est au pays, on doit être là avec les mesures nécessaires. Je ne suis pas convaincu, M. le Président, que le Premier ministre réalise vraiment ce que c'est une situation difficile pour le vrai monde. Est-ce qu'il réalise d'abord que la santé relève du Québec et des provinces? Est-ce qu'il réalise qu'il avait peu à faire à cet égard? Est-ce qu'il réalise qu'il a réussi à se planter? Et est-ce qu'il réalise que l'énergie qu'on devrait mettre à lutter contre la pandémie est mise à lutter contre un problème de sécurité qui n'aurait jamais dû se produire pendant sa veille? C'est ce qu'on a envoyé aux We provinces et territoires et ce qu'on a dépensé en dépenses de la santé du fédéral pour aider à traverser cette pandémie à tous les Canadiens. On a investi 8 sur 10 d'argent dépensé pour uh, appuyer les Canadiens directement du fédéral. Nous avons été là pour les gens. Je comprends que le Bloc québécois a horreur de l'idée que le gouvernement fédéral puisse être là pour les Québécois, mais on l'a été et on va continuer de l'être pendant aussi longtemps que nécessaire. Conservative Party members can stand with people who wave swastikas. They can stand with people who wave uh, the Confederate flag. We will choose to stand with Canadians who deserve to be able to get to their jobs, who be able to get their lives back. These illegal protests need to stop, and they will, Mr. Speaker.
just want to remind the honourable members, including the honourable right honourable prime minister, to use words that are not inflammatory in the house, and that's for both sides. The honourable member for Thornhill. Unbecoming, uh, unbecoming as a prime minister. It's been 48 hours that the government went from doing nothing to a national emergency. 48 hours into using the measures, 48 hours without providing Parliament with a justification. So my question is simple. When will the Prime Minister admit that he's lost control of the situation, that he's lost control of his country, that he's lost control of his caucus, and that he's lost control of his leadership? Yeah. Yeah. Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Of caucus in support for these blockades, the Conservative politicians need to make a choice. Are they for the blockades or are they for communities, our economy, and regular Canadians? The member from Provence pointed out about the emergency blockade, the illegal blockades. He has never seen such a patriotic display in Canada. There's nothing patriotic about hurting fellow Canadians. The member from Grand Prairie Mackenzie claims that the economy is not being held hostage. All the while, hundreds of millions of dollars were being lost in trade due to Bauclades. And the member from Sarnia Lambton doesn't believe her constituents need guaranteed access now to the Blue Water Bridge. Mr. Speaker, we stand with Canadians. The Honourable Member for Regina Capel. Mr. Speaker, in 2020, when anti-energy protesters were blocking vital transportation, ships were backed up in ports and trains were stopped. The Prime Minister didn't stop them. In fact, he actually sent a government delegation to meet with them. But now that the protests are about something that he disagrees with, he uses inflammatory language, hurls personal attacks and makes a massive power grab. We know the PM finds democracy inconvenient and that he admires China's dictatorship. So will the Prime Minister admit that this is all just a move to crack down on dissent. The right honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I would advise the honourable member to be careful in that line of, uh, line of questioning before people actually look into what he and his fellow party, Conservative Party members said. I want to remind the honourable members that shouting names at each other is not the way this place works. No, 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 no. Before you start clapping, start looking at your own benches. The right honourable Prime Minister, please continue. Mr. Speaker, people across this country have noticed the difference uh, between the uh, words and the rhetoric of the Conservative Party of Canada in regards uh, to Indigenous protests, in regards to Black Lives Matter protests, in regards to marginalized people uh, asking for their rights, versus uh, the, what we're seeing here of illegal blockades that are hurting regular Canadians, uh, and even talked about uh, the potential overthrow of a duly elected government. That is not uh, what is responsible for the Conservative. Honourable Member for Regina Capel. Mr. Speaker, Conservatives denounced the blockades of vital transportation routes in 2020, and we have denounced the same blockades this time, Mr. Speaker. The only thing that has changed is the Prime Minister's reaction. When he agreed with the anti-energy protesters, he let them continue for weeks and even offered a settlement. This time, he grants himself unprecedented powers to attack those he disagrees with. Canadians do not want to live in a country where the Prime Minister gets to personally decide which protests are legitimate. So once again, isn't this all just about cracking down on dissent? The right honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as a government, we have always stood up for the right to peaceful protest. We have always stood up for the right to freedom of assembly or freedom of expression. Mr. Speaker, these illegal blockades are hurting Canadians, are hurting their livelihoods, uh, and are hurting the well-being and endangering the well-being of people and communities across this country. Uh, but the, the uh, former leader of the Conservative Party points out that they have stood against the blockades. Unfortunately, many members of his party Party have stood with these illegal blockades and even encouraged them to continue blockading their fellow citizens. Honourable Member for Burnaby South. We're in the midst of a national crisis, and this national crisis has exposed some real frustrations that Canadians feel. 
Canadians that have gotten vaccinated, that have followed the public health guidelines, are looking at a rigged system where billionaires and millionaires make out like bandits, increase their wealth, where working families and working class families are struggling to get by. So what is the Prime Minister going to do to respond to the frustrations of Canadians who can't put a roof over their head, who are having struggles to put food on the table? What is he doing to respond to that real, legitimate frustration? The Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, every step of the way through this crisis, uh, from, the, from, beginning, from the beginning of the pandemic, we've had Canadians' backs. With unprecedented supports uh, for our health systems, so people could get tests and vaccines and health supports, so people could uh, get wage subsidies and rent subsidies to keep small businesses going and to keep people in their jobs. A direct support for seniors, for youth, for working families, uh, for mothers. These are things that we've moved forward on to have Canadians backs and we will continue to be investing in housing, uh, in uh, immigration measures, uh, in the measures that are going to be supporting Canadians into the The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Cette crise nationale a exposé des, inqui des inquiétudes, des injustices dans notre système. Monsieur, Madame, tout le monde voit les milliardaires qui gagnent des profits records au même temps qu'il est de plus en plus difficile de trouver du logement abordable. C'est de plus en plus difficile de rejoindre les deux bouts. Donc, le Premier ministre, est-ce qu'il est prêt de s'engager à répondre aux frustrations des gens avec des mesures pour répondre aux besoins des gens, pour régler les problèmes avec le coût de la vie qui augmente et les problèmes de trouver des logements abordables. Très honorable Premier ministre. Monsieur le Président, dans ma dernière réponse, j'ai parlé un petit peu de tout ce qu'on a fait depuis le début de cette pandémie, mais en plus de ça, nous savons que nous devons en faire plus, aller de l'avant. Mais je soulignerai par contre qu'il y a des familles à travers le pays, dans des endroits comme en Alberta, au Manitoba et ailleurs, Manitoba où des familles sont en train de sauver des centaines de dollars par mois avec hundreds, hundreds euh, des places en garderie moins chères et plus abordables. On a fait un impact direct dans la famille des We've gens à travers le pays avec des garderies abordables et on espère que bientôt l'Ontario va signer et faire partie de cette solution aussi. As a member of the House of Commons Standing Committee for the Environment and Sustainable Development, I look forward to reviewing this legislation when it comes to this place. Could the Prime Minister comment on the importance of this legislation in helping us to address the climate crisis, as well as recovering clean lakes, rivers and streams and providing ongoing protection for our environment? Great thank you, Mr. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for Guelph for his important question and his tireless advocacy on behalf of the environment. This bill is a big step towards strengthening the protection of Canadians' health and the health of our lakes, rivers, lands and forests from harmful chemicals and other toxic pollutants. This legislation can help us all become better stewards of our environment, making Canada a better place for us and for the generations that follow. I encourage all parliamentarians to work together to pass this bill as soon as possible. Well, member for Red Deer Lacombe. Mr. Speaker, two-thirds of Canadians want to see COVID restrictions and mandates lifted. We have amongst the highest vaccination rate in the world, but Canadians are still living under restrictions that many other less vaccinated countries have lifted. Canadians want a plan for ending restrictions, and they are incredibly disappointed that the NDP and the Liberals blocked our Conservative motion asking for one. So, Mr. Speaker, if 32% of the vote is good enough for the Liberals to form government, why isn't 90% good enough to lift mandates? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, for two years, Canadians have been there for each other, and all of us together, we've followed the science. We've made sure that people get vaccinated. We've made sure uh, that people have access to rapid tests. And every step of the way, uh, we will be ensuring that we're doing exactly what's necessary, both uh, to keep people safe from COVID, but also to get back to the things we love as quickly as possible. I was pleased to see this week uh, the lifting of a number of restrictions around international travel. We're going to continue uh, to monitor carefully and ensure uh, that uh, we follow the science as we keep Canadians safe.
The Honorable Member for Carlton Trail Eagle Creek. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The only thing this Prime Minister has made sure of is that he has politicized this pandemic and divided Canadians at a time when we should be working together, when we should be supporting one another. His lack of leadership has divided, stigmatized and traumatized Canadians. Provincial Premiers are leading the way, giving hope, confidence and rebuilding trust in leadership. When will this Prime Minister follow their lead? Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the 90% vaccination rate in Canada shows that Canadians have actually never been more united. The stories we saw throughout this pandemic of people being there for their neighbours, people there to support frontline workers, people there uh, to support uh, their communities, demonstrates the ability to which Canadians have stepped up to be there for each other. Yes, there have been people who have been uh, harassing and intimidating frontline workers. Yes, there are people involved in, front line, in illegal blockades, but the vast majority of Canadians continue to stand alongside each other and support here, each here, other. Here, Mr. Here. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Lakeland. Two-thirds of Canadians are united because they want an end to mandates and lockdowns. But this Prime Minister said they're, quote, racist, misogynist, a fringe, who, quote, take up space, and he said shouldn't be tolerated. Security experts say the Emergencies Act is a, quote, absolutely unprecedented excessive overreach, and half the provinces oppose it. But this PM's pattern is failure and top-down division. He's gone from name-calling to nukes. Isn't this really about the Prime Minister taking a sledgehammer to Canadians that he thinks are unacceptable? The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I believe the member opposite misspoke. I think it's actually 100% of Canadians who are tired of this COVID pandemic, who are tired of having to uh, be restricted, of ha having tired of having uh, to be impacted by this pandemic around the, around the country and around the globe. We all want to get through it. However, the way to get through it is by following science, by keeping each other safe, by being there for each other. The way through this pandemic isn't to engage in illegal blockades uh, that uh, are harming their fellow Canadians. L'honorable député de Chicoutimi Le Fjord. Monsieur le Président, hier, le gouvernement du Mr. Québec Speaker, a annoncé la levée du passeport vaccinal et un plan de déconfinement précis avec des objectifs clairs. Comment ça se fait que le gouvernement fédéral n'est pas capable de faire la même chose? Même le député de Louis Hébert a voté en faveur de notre motion qui demandait la levée des mesures. Le Premier ministre utilise As vraiment la pandémie à des fins partisanes et électorales pour sauver sa job. Quand va-t-il enlever toutes les mesures sanitaires au pays? Le président, le député sait très bien que la grande majorité des mesures sanitaires à travers le pays sont appliquées par les provinces. Au niveau des frontières, nous avons la responsabilité au fédéral et je suis très content de pouvoir souligner qu'il y a depuis quelques jours, nous avons euh, annoncé un changement de notre posture à la frontière et nous allons rendre ça plus facile pour les Canadiens vaccinés euh, de travailler ou de voyager outre-mer. C'est une bonne chose pour les Canadiens et on va continuer de suivre la science pour alléger les restrictions parce que c'est ce que les Canadiens veulent et c'est ce dont on a tous besoin. Le député de belleuil chambly le Premier ministre référait aux investissements faits par le gouvernement fédéral dans le cadre de la pandémie. Je me permets de lui rappeler que ce sont des investissements faits à crédit. C'est l'argent des Québécois et des Canadiens. C'est une dette qu'il laissera aux Québécois et aux Canadiens et qu'il aurait dû mettre en place sans essayer d'imposer des conditions avant de faire des transferts en santé beaucoup plus importants que les erreurs des derniers jours. Il ramène d'ailleurs sans honte des... Il rappelle sans honte des événements parmi les plus sombres de l'histoire récente de son pays. Est-ce qu'il est conscient qu'on n'a pas besoin de lui pour aller à la banque et est-ce qu'il est conscient qu'on n'a pas besoin de la loi sur les mesures d'urgence pour contenir la crise au Québec? Honorable Premier ministre, les Canadiens d'un bout à l'autre de ce pays ont vécu deux années extrêmement difficiles, avec des pertes tragiques, avec des sacrifices personnels et collectifs que nous avons tous pu faire. Et à chaque étape, le gouvernement fédéral a été là 
government pour les was gens. there là, for people. Là, avec des vaccinations gratuites pour tout le monde. Là, avec des investissements pour aider les petites entreprises, les grandes entreprises, les travailleurs, les familles, les aînés. À chaque étape, le gouvernement fédéral a été là, incluant pour les Québécois. Et c'est ça qui déçoit le Bloc québécois. Ce que le premier ministre présente est dans une certaine mesure le constat de son propre échec, M. le Président. Est-ce qu'il est conscient qu'une loi aussi importante que la loi sur les mesures d'urgence, je répète, la loi sur les mesures d'urgence, devrait commander un certain consensus à l'intérieur de la Chambre, l'opposition officielle et contre le Bloc québécois. Et contre, j'invite de nouveau le MPD à réfléchir, pardon, prudemment, prudemment à ce sujet-là. Reconnaît-il reconnaît qu'il y aurait eu d'autres moyens pour agir et reconnaît-il qu'il n'a pas la légitimité d'imposer cette loi au Québec? Les honorables premier ministre. C'est extrêmement important que tout le monde sache que la loi sur les mesures d'urgence est extrêmement euh, est proscrite et structurée d'une façon extrêmement claire et que nous suivons à la lettre les instructions pour son application et nous avons... Euh, de, dès le début, reconnu euh, qu'on devait euh, euh, cibler ces mesures-là, qu'ils devaient être toujours assujettis à la protection, aux protections pour les citoyens euh, dans la charte euh, des, euh, des droits et libertés et euh, qu'ils n'allaient être utilisés que lorsqu'ils en ont besoin par la police de juridiction locale. C'est ça, cette loi sur les mesures d'urgence. Coming from this prime minister. My great grandfather flew over 30 missions over Nazi Germany. My great great uncle's body lies at the bottom of the English Channel. There are members of this conservative caucus who are the descendants of victims of the Holocaust. For the prime minister to accuse any colleague in this house of standing with the swastika is shameful. I'm giving the prime minister an opportunity. I'm calling on him to unreservedly apologize for this shameful remark. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Canadians deserve their freedoms back. Mr. Speaker, these illegal blockades that have continued to interfere with people's livelihoods, to interfere with people's uh, people's daily lives, uh, have. I have to interrupt the Honourable Prime Minister. So ask everyone to calm down so we can hear the answer. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker. The measures put forward in this uh, Emergencies Act are proportional, are responsible, and quite frankly, uh, are completely folded within the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The steps that we are taking are important and measured to restore order and freedoms to Canadians in this country. That is exactly what we are doing. Well, member for Sturgeon River, Parkland. Mr. Speaker, the lack of an apology from that Prime Minister speaks volumes. I have given this Prime Minister an opportunity to retract a shameful remark where he would accuse any honourable member of this House to stand with a swastika. As I said before, we have colleagues who are the descendants of victims of the Holocaust. I'm giving the Prime Minister one more chance. Will he apologize to all members of this House? That's the right honourable Prime Minister. The members of the Conservative Party are calling to, uh, to us to take more action over the past two weeks on this. Uh, they continue to stand with and encourage these illegal blockades. Mr. Speaker, uh, Canadians uh, are watching carefully and see exactly where the Conservative politicians who've stood with uh, those blockades uh, are standing. We will stand on the side of Canadians who deserve their lives back, who deserve their livelihoods back. Member for Sturgeon River Parkland. My apologies, Mr. Speaker. I didn't write these out. But the fact is, I don't know how any member of the government caucus can stand by this Prime Minister when he accuses honourable members of this House of standing with a swastika. I'm calling on all members of the Liberal Caucus to denounce the Prime Minister. I have given him two chances to apologize. He has refused to apologize. Mr. Prime Minister, apologize!
once again, I want to remind the honourable members, I know this is getting emotional, but place your questions through the speaker, not directly to each other. The right honourable Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. These illegal blockades have been going on in Ottawa for 20 days now. Uh, people have been, uh, uh, have been interrupted in their daily lives, have been made to feel fearful, have been made uh, to uh, miss shifts uh, at their work in, across southern Ontario. These are things that cannot be stood for, which is why we're moving forward with a responsible set of measures to allow the local police jurisdiction to do their jobs. We continue to defend freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, as long as it's peaceful and legal, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member, the Honourable Deputy of Lac Saint Louis. Mr. President, the sectors of tourism and of voyage have been severely affected by the pandemic. The travel sectors have been hurt hit by the pandemic. The organizations and organizations in these domains are excited and have hope to be able to welcome and to make more people vaccinated. The Prime Minister, can he tell us more about the sanitary measures that are being taken by the Premier Ministry? Can he tell us more about the sanitary measures? Monsieur le Président, je remercie le député pour tout le travail qu'il a accompli pour sa circonscription de l'Actinou. Nos mesures pour les voyageurs évoluent au fur et à mesure de l'évolution de la pandémie et des recommandations de la santé publique. C'est pour ça qu'à compter du 28 février, nous allons lever l'interdiction des vols vers tous les aéroports qui reçoivent normalement des vols internationaux. Ça va aider à soutenir le tourisme local et contribuer à la création de bons emplois et à la croissance de notre économie. L'honorable député de Mégantic, l'érable. Monsieur le Président, aujourd'hui, le Premier ministre Speaker, a fait la démonstration claire qu'il n'est intéressé que par une seule chose, se sortir de la crise qu'il a lui-même créée. Son manque de leadership est le seul responsable de cette crise. Il a cité les livres d'histoire tout à l'heure. Il va passer à l'histoire pour le Premier ministre ayant eu le moins de leadership de l'histoire du Canada, Monsieur le Président. Il n'a pratiquement répondu à aucune question de l'opposition sur la justice. Du recours à la loi sur les mesures d'urgence. Ce qu'on a vu, c'est un premier ministre qui est lui-même en crise. Dans les sondages, en son parti, en son caucus, pour pas mettre ses propres intérêts devant son nation. Très honorable, le premier ministre. Depuis le début de ces blocages illégaux, nous avons été là pour appuyer les policiers de juridiction locale pour pouvoir régler ces blocages illégaux. Et nous avons, au fur et à mesure, vu qu'on avait besoin de donner des outils supplémentaires, ce qu'on a fait de façon responsable et mesurée lundi soir. On est en train d'être là pour aider là où c'est nécessaire. C'est ce à quoi les Canadiens s'attendent. Pendant que les les conservateurs continuent d'encourager ces blocages illégaux. Nous, nous agissons pour aider la police locale à les éliminer. Honorable député de Mégantic Monsieur le Président, le Premier ministre aura beau insulter tous les Canadiens, c'est pas ça faire preuve de leadership, Monsieur le Président. Jamais le Canada n'a été aussi divisé qu'aujourd'hui. C'est ce qui arrive quand il y a un Premier ministre qui choisit de jouer le grand politicien plutôt que le chef d'État, Monsieur le Président. Il entend il n'entend pas la grogne dans nos comtés, il n'entend pas la grogne dans son parti, dans son caucus, il n'entend pas la grogne au pays, M. le Président. Ça, c'est la réalité. Mais est-ce que quelqu'un peut nous dire aujourd'hui pourquoi ce premier ministre est toujours en retard pour faire ce qui est juste et toujours prêt quand c'est sa réputation qui est en jeu? Je comprends Mr. tout à fait et nous entendons tous à quel point les gens sont tannés de cette pandémie, sont tannés des mesures nécessaires pour se protéger les uns et les autres. On veut passer à travers. Mais je peux rappeler aux députés du Parti conservateur que la façon d'en finir avec la pandémie, ce n'est pas avec des manifestations illégales. C'est en suivant la science, en faisant de façon responsable une progression dans les mesures de santé et c'est en se faisant vacciner. C'est ce que les Canadiens ont fait. Et d'ailleurs, l'unité du pays face à la vaccination démontre à quel point on va toujours rester là les uns pour les autres. Honorable député de Mégantic-Lérable. Voyons ce que lui a fait, M. le Président. Quand il a eu l'occasion d'agir en chef d'État devant la COVID, il a choisi de faire de la politique. Il a déclenché des élections en pleine pandémie, ce qui lui a permis de diviser les Canadiens et de stigmatiser ceux et celles qui ne pensent pas comme lui. Il a imposé un vaccin aux camionneurs sans aucune preuve scientifique. Il a démonisé et 
ridiculiser une partie de ses propres citoyens au lieu d'écouter ce qu'ils avaient à dire. Il s'est caché au lieu de faire face et a accusé les autres de ne pas faire leur travail. C'est assez, M. le Président. Quand le premier ministre va-t-il s'excuser aux Canadiens d'avoir politisé cette crise? Le premier ministre. Monsieur le Président, dans ces dernières élections contrary, que Speaker, le Parti conservateur n'a pas gagné, election, les Canadiens ont été consultés sur l'enjeu des mandats de vaccination et sur la vaccination. Mandates, et les Canadiens ont voté majoritairement pour des députés qui appuyaient une vaccination obligatoire pour les euh, travailleurs de la fonction publique et public pour les voyages euh, en avion et en train. C'est les Canadiens eux-mêmes qui ont choisi on et d'ailleurs, on a vu avec un taux de vaccination d'autour de 90 que les Canadiens sont unis et alignés et vont rester là les uns pour les autres. And they will continue to be there for each other. Mr. Speaker, immigrants from coast to coast to coast have significantly contributed to the prosperity of this country and of my riding of Scarborough Aging Court. Last year, we exceeded our goal of welcoming over 401,000 immigrants that will make Canada their home. This was a historical record that will help shape Canada's growth. Can the Prime Minister update this House on our government's plan to welcome more newcomers in the coming years? You write, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, immigration is and has always been essential to Canada's success. This pandemic has highlighted the contributions of newcomers to the well-being of our communities and across all sectors of the economy. It's why we tabled our most ambitious immigration plan levels plan yet. This plan will welcome more newcomers in the, ne in, the three in the coming year and will continue to help key sectors of our economy. It will help staff almost a million unfilled positions across all sectors. It will also help filling in for the 5 million Canadians set to retire by 2030. Here, here. Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Many Canadians are raising serious concerns that the Emergency Act should not apply to legal protests. We know that there have been many counter-protesters who are standing up to the convoy, and we've seen some of those counter-protesters arrested by police instead of the actual convoy. So Canadians raise the question, what assurances will the Prime Minister provide so that legal protests are not impacted by the invocation of the Emergencies Act? Here. Right, Honourable Prime Minister. It's an excellent question and one we are also very much preoccupied with, which is why uh, in uh, the measures set forward, we've been very clear uh, to indicate that uh, illegal protests, illegal barricades, illegal blockages are the ones that we are giving extra tools for the police to respond to. Of course, we will always stand up for Canadians' charter rights. We will always stand up for freedom of peaceful assembly, of freedom of expression. That is extremely important. But we we also know that it is the police of jurisdiction who need to do their jobs and not Canadians taking uh, things into their own hands to end these illegal protests. That's what we're ensuring with this measure. That's all the time we have for question period.